السلام عليكم for uh, inviting me here uh, before i start this talk i would like to i would like to say um, i'm really um, glad to share this stage with so many wonderful people first with brahan nagga who has inspired who has inspired so many people during the 2005 election by bringing idealism as a central cause to fight for and also who has disappointed so many people like me by departing from the field I'm also honored to be on this stage with uh, Aranga Ibari, uh, a real fighter, a man of truth, a man of courage, who has said hell to you and stood with truth. And also with the speaker, I don't, I, I haven't, you know, I don't know you, but I'm, I'm really happy with uh, the, your presentation. Last but not least, with uh, Masai Kabbada, who has been grilling me for the last uh, four or five months, and who has, in many ways, has contributed to uh, uh, forcing me to think to, about this presentation. And I'm a little bit threatened that he's going to speak after me and <laughs> take me on. All right, uh, let's go to the presentation. Um, my topic is uh, towards, multi towards multicultural democracy, reconciling nationalism. And this topic, I'm going to focus uh, just on one aspect of multiculturalism, the political part of it. There are two, there are two things. And so I'm not going to talk about it. 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 So there are uh, two aspects of, uh, uh, there are two aspects of multiculturalism. Uh, one is uh, the, the, what I call it the political aspect of it, the nationalism, and the other one is the identity part. Identity need to be, uh, you know, uh, we need integrity of cultures, uh, and integration of cultures, and, but we need reconciliation of the uh, political aspect. So I'll focus on the political aspect for today. Um, now, in Ethiopia there are two nationalisms that have existed and still continue to exist side by side which is Ethiopian nationalism, Ethiopian nationalism, pan-Ethiopian nationalism, whatever you call it. And the other one is ethno-nationalism. These two forces started to fight. I mean, their, their original contention can be traced back to the emergence of the modern Ethiopian state. The cause for this contention is one is the emergence of the he Shawan hegemony at the end of the 19th century. This led to subjugation of the South and the Gabbard system, which was oppressive, repressive, and that was attempting to uh, forcefully assimilate the South at the same time, which was extremely exploitive. Now, what that produced was it led us to a resistance, emergence of rebellion in the South, in the Bale, in the Raya, in every other places, and a revolutionary politics also came towards the end of the uh, 16th, uh, 1960s in the center, in Addis Ababa and uh, everywhere else. Now, the other issue that led to this growth of contention between the two nationalisms is the land, the land and national rights came at the central slogan for the progressive movement in 1970s. These slogans are challenged and resisted by the conservative establishment of the Haile Selassie regime. During this time, there was an attempt to compromise these two competing and conflicting nationalisms. One of the attempts was to accept national rights, or what they call the national question, as a just cause. What this has done is two things. One, it provided a safe venue for ethno-nationalists to express their feeling and their anger toward the center. At the same time, it also contains them. It contains the ethno-nationalists within the Ethiopian umbrella organizations. However, there was a problem during this student movement. There was a hyped acceptance of national rights. One, because of a tactical move, a need to ally with Eritreans, two, because of peer pressure, and so on and so on. What this has a problem, when politics got radicalized towards the early 70s, we have people talking about armed struggle and communism and all this stuff really prevented the progressive, um, 
negotiation from uh, 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 becoming uh, fruitful. Then the regime collapsed before the movement uh, emerged, um, before the movement matured. Now, the crash of the progressive politics in Ethiopia has a devastating impact to what we are talking today. What it did really is this. One, after the crash of the progressive movement, Derg adopted a very conservative right-wing nationalist rhetoric. Why? Number one, the Somali war and the resurgence of Ethiopian nationalism, that was beaten down by the student movements. This provided the Derg a political capital. Therefore, it didn't need to ally itself or it didn't need to keep the alliance with the progressive forces. No longer communism and the land for Taylor and all these slogans were important. You can just say Ethiopia took them and you are on the right track. Second, the opposition made a tactical decision to ally themselves with Eritreans, separatist Eritreans. What Mangustu only need to do, needed to do at that time was to say, what? These people are going to split the country. These people are mercenaries who are going to split the country. And the nation was so scared, they said, dude, go ahead. <laughs> now, Turk, by adopting this very violent Ethiopian nationalist, it was also a very violent and repressive regime. The ordinary people, especially in areas I grew up, never understood the difference between Ethiopian nationalists, Ethiopian them, and let me kill you was the same in that area. <laughs> <laughs> This was very important for uh, a lot of people. It was very important for ethnic for international movements. What it did was this. They could simply say, hey, you are being repressed by the name of Ethiopia. You gotta fight Ethiopia. They intensified a very effective anti-Amhara and anti-Ethiopian campaign. And finally, they defeated Dirk. Now, when Dirk was defeated, I was a little young. When Dirk was defeated, was it a fall of a repressive regime, or was it a defeat of Ethiopian nationalism? I think Ethiopian nationalists took it to say that Ethiopian nationalism is dead, and we have defeated it, we are going to bury it. Then this led to the hegemony of the Ethiopian nationalism. The Ethiopian nationalism that took power in 1991 had a very interesting uh, dynamic. They defeated Dirk and they continue to attempt to dismantle Ethiopian nationalism. Ethiopian nationalism went underground. <laughs> the Ethiopian nationalism has this transformative role. They are dominating the center. They are running the country. They continue to talk this peripheral rhetoric. They continue to talk about this Ethiopia as oppressing people, but they are still in power. So we had this void of state ideology. Malazena is in power and talking about golden people of Tigray, but he's running Ethiopia. This has a very serious consequence. You cannot run a house and still talk for the Gwada. It was very important at that stage. <laughs> now, this consequence has one. It, it led to failure of the government. No value judgment. It led to failure of the government to advance collective interest. Nobody cared about sea to access. You are running a country and you are cutting the sea to access and it's gonna bear, it's gonna bite you back because the economy will be badly affected. Your power will be in question. So they let the, the, the Eritrean situation go messy. It's nationalization of everything. Even the national military, okay. I have no problem with, with the uh, regions and everything else. Even the national military, the postal service, everything became such an ethnic enclave. And Still, they are in power and they are saying, hey, if you push us any further, further, we will dismantle the country. They continued their obsessive anti-Amhara nationalism or anti-Amhara rhetoric. This led to another problem for Ethiopia. Amhara self-defense. Amhara is under attack. Amhara self-defense came to overlap with Ethiopian nationalism. Maia, Ma'ad, and all these organizations were having Ethiopian plug in one hand and talking Amhara in the other hand. This justifies the long-standing claim of the Ethiopian nationalism. And it was a major devastation to Ethiopian nationalism. <laughs> now, all these games that was played in the 90s had a backlash against the Ethiopian nationalism. Why? We as a nation and nationalities took power. However, 
what we have is a minority domination and a continued repression. You have a new guys, new government, new rhetoric, the same rule for ordinary people, the same repressive system. Worse, this time you have a clearly defined minority group exploiting and repressing people. Therefore, the, we the nation nationalities promise of 1991-92 was unfulfilled and miserably failed within five to say, ten years. This led to emergence of a very right-wing reactionary Ethiopian nationalism that manifested itself as an opposition force in 2005. Now, safeguarding unity and dissolving ethnic federalism, regaining Assad and individual rights at the slogan. Now, the post-2005 Understanding or maybe misreading the 2000 election. Was it a voting for change? Were people voting for change? Or was it a referendum on ethnic federalism? I think the right wing group, the right wing group took it as a referendum on ethnic federalism. People are rejected ethnic politics, ethno nationalism has failed. The same mistake the ethno nationalists made in 1991, mind you. The same mistake, just 15 years later. Some voted for change. Some voted for, and again, no doubt, during this time, there are people who wanted to do away with ethnic federalism. There are also people who are just fed up with Mala Zainawi. So it has to be understood from that point of view. This election was also a warning to the nationalists that hegemony is no longer safe. They can no longer be the only game in town. Ethiopian nationalism is silent and hiding, but not dead. It's going to wait time, it's going to come up. So it showed them that. This election was also brought a backlash within a very short period of time against reactionary forces. The post-election alliance of ethno-nationalist elites. Let me repeat. The post-election alliance of ethno-nationalist elites with Mala Zainawi is a clear example. Opirio has more educated people today than ever before in its history. Why? Because the Oromo elites feared that Haile Selassie is coming back. Now, the status quo. Now well, the status quo found itself in a very murky situation. One, they saw that Ethiopian nationalism is coming up. So what do they do? They, adopt, they adopted this Ethiopian rhetoric. There is flag day where you are forced to have the flag, to buy it actually. You buy for $10. You have um, rhetoric of you know, so, um, national sovereignty and talking about Eritrea and talking about Somalia. You have reclaiming 300 years. Malaz Zainal was saying, saying Ethiopia has 100 years. And just 15 years down the road, he's saying, no, we have 3,000 years ago, it's all, uh, years of history. The only problem is that, oh, the first millennium was great, the second was dark, and now we are starting the new one. <laughs> and the very secessionist party that took power in Ethiopia is waging a very anti-secessionist rhetoric against Ogaden. This all Ethiopianism is, at the same time, when they have intensified, this is weird, when they have intensified <coughs> Tigrayan supremacy. In the last four years, it is scary. I was in, I was in, in, in Addis Ababa just a couple of weeks ago. It is scary what they're doing. At the same time, they're talking about Ethiopia. The future. I think project, progressive politics is the way forward. Neither of the two nationalisms can sustain hegemony. We have seen this. But each have a significant supporter and a proponent. I disagree with my friends here. Ethno-nationalism has a significant support. Ethiopian nationalism has a significant support, and they will continue to be, they have to negotiate and reconcile. <laughs> Neither will cease to exist. And actually, they are very important. From my standpoint, they are very important. Ethno-nationalism will help us to deal with historic disparities and it will also help us to preserve cultural identities. Oromo nationalism is the greatest thing that happened to Ethiopia. It preserved, the, it recreated and preserved Oromo identity, which, is, which will help us to usher a very important democratic value in Ethiopia. Okay? <laughs> At the same time, this is not the end of the game. Ethiopian nationalism will help us to safeguard the existence of the state and will help us to advance the collective interest of the nation. 
therefore multinational democracy requires a negotiated consensus between these two attach up boy then current dialogue would be all like now for this for these two nationalism to to negotiate and reconcile we have to understand the political spectrum in ethiopia i took this from uh, leon baradat um, his book is so called um, ideology its origin and impact i found it very important i've been thinking how to understand ethiopian politics it's so little crazy so i found this now baradat puts he says political and ideological spectrum should be understood on how what kind of change they want and how much now on the left he has a radical somewhere next there liberal moderate conservative and reactionary the radical says i am sick of this system i want to dismantle it and create a new one he has no face nothing in the system so he want to create a new one in the opposite direction you have the reactionary right wing that says you know what i'm tired of this system the past was better let's go back these are two opposing but the same they are both extremists they are fed up with the system one want to go forward the other one going to go backward you have the liberal that says you know what this system is messed up it has to be improved and i believe in the duty of these people it says we need an institutional and a functional change while the others the, the remaining two the two extremes require and demand a structural change to the country or to the system this ones require institutional or functional change there's a moderate that say you know this system is bad but if i want to push it everything is going to be messy therefore i need a incremental and gradual change you have the, the status quo or the conservative that say you know what i'm good let's keep these things okay in ethiopia gadel mamitu takalachu is gadel mamitu now imagine gadel ranya yonachu ሁለት አፋፋል you have one hill on this side and you have another hill on the side so you have the radical ethno nationalist that is fed up with the system they say you know what this empire can never be democratized i want to rip it apart he stands there and shouts to the other one the reactionary said you know everything that went wrong in ethiopia is because of ethnicity you know what we need to go back to one solid country no ethnicity nothing nothing so they yell at each other you have the status quo which is positioned itself in the middle very well for the radical it tells him this reaction is going to take you back to hell this <laughs> no you don't want that and for the other one it tells you these people are going to split this country you are not going to have a country at the same time it also represses the progressive voice that says the voice of reason and the voice of consent is represented in ethiopia by both these three groups the status quo will keep it down because it will expose its lies the radical hates it because it is this one be Yes, yeah, sell out. It's a sell out because he has renegade in his ethnicity. The reactionary says, "You know what? Oh, I hear the word here in DC. They say the, the Hamara apologist. So the progressive is the Hamara apologist or the Romo sell out. <laughs> Now, therefore, it appears in a, in a, become a whole stage of radical and reactionary politicians. Each has a very small base." it has a very small base two ideology highly committed and effectively organized you will be surprised the radical ethno nationalist and the rea- reactionary right wing ethiopianist are very very effective and they are very vocal they hear each other uh, there was uh, this guy who told me erse berse bichano midamamatut mahakal la yer okay they hear each other so for an romo the amhara is just that radical reactionary the voice of reason doesn't exist the same uh, for the other one their shared characteristics is this fear and insecurity the radical uses fear of eternal domination the reactionary nationalist uses fear of disintegration of the country to maintain its base each promises aspires and preaches elimination of the other the radical says you know what these chauvinists will disappear will be the mark and the uh, reactionary says this zaranyoch drasha cho itafal will eliminate them. <laughs> each invasion takes this not very seriously each invasion is a unilateral solution for this complicated problem and hopes to have a monolithic power in ethiopia now challenges opportunities of pro- progressive politics in ethiopia one the subdued and submissive intellectual that has become I was going to use what bad word that has become really really just a slave 
for radical and extreme, extreme highly organized groups. You have a populist and opportunist leadership. As I said, because two groups are very efficient and resourceful, the leadership always goes begging them and aspiring them instead of challenging their position. They are willing, not willing to take risk because these people are vicious, they will insult you, they will attack you, so they are scared. The leadership say, you know what, you're right. <laughs> You'll be surprised. The majority of the Romo leaders don't believe in uh, sensationism, but they are, they are after. They will, they will submit to the radical position. And the majority of the Ethiopian leadership, Ethiopian leadership, don't believe in dismantlement of ethnic federalism, neither do they believe in the end of ethnic politics. But they say, end of ethnic politics, end of ethnic politics with reactionaries. This is wrong, in my view. Violence, uh, as a most preferred method, has been taken. We are tired of it in 40 years. In these 40 years, it really prevented compromise politics. It made it uh, useless. As opportunity, uh, what I see is growing rejection of radical and reactionary politics. In a society, trust me, I go everywhere. In a society, if I go there and bash up, even among the Oromo, if I bash Amara continuously, people are fed up. The same with the, the, with, with the Ethiopian group. Emergence of a materialistic group. My generation really doesn't care much about ideology. We really just care. Yet, really. People are fed up. People really, the younger people really care about efficiency. Hey, you promised democracy, show me the money. You know? Oh, you, 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 you promised me liberty or independence? Show me the money. If you don't show the money, extremists can't show the money because they are very small. That is a hope. And last, we have a changing world. The world we live in is not the Cold War world. It's a world where nonviolent struggle has a lot of proponents and supporters. One minute. Dr. Brown is shorter than me. <laughs> he lived longer than me. OK? He takes twice. I'm younger, and I have a lot to live, and taller than him, too. So I need more time, people. So, a friend, we're talking in here, and uh, there is a friend uh, who is in Ethiopia right now. Um, we're seeing an idea, and he said, one tragic aspect of Ethiopian politics is the almost total absence of progressive Amaras, once embodied in the energetic personality of Walali Mokonde. He said, one tragic aspect of Ethiopian politics is the almost total absence of progressive Amaras, once embodied in the energetic personality of he added, though, in a promising note, but I believe that even now progressive politics is later not dead in the Amhara community. It will sooner or later assert itself. And I said, brother, silence is not golden anymore. Speak up. <laughs> well, I say I join my friend for this group, I join and say, <laughs> another tragic aspect of Ethiopian politics is the continued refusal of the progressive Oromo nationalist to step up and assert his ownership of Ethiopia mm, right. and play a constructive role <laughs> to build an inclusive, to build an inclusive democracy and a strong and just home for all of us. Yes. On optimistic note, I say, although silent and absent, the vast majority of Oromo nationalists are still progressive, and who will come forward when time comes? Conclusion, I want to conclude by criticizing this conference. Yesterday I was talking to a friend, said, hey, are you going to a conference? And they're talking to each other. Are you say, going to a conference? And I said, which conference? Oh, that conference of the Amara and the Jawar. <laughs> <laughs> this conference, like all Ethiopian conference, is not inclusive. Where is the Somali? The most devastating civil war is going on in Ogaden. Those are the most repressed and persecuted people in that country today. Where are they? Where is Oromo nationalist? There are 25,000 Oromo political prisoners in Ethiopia today. Yesterday, some 12 of them were sentenced to death and long time imprisonment. I didn't see any, any condemnation from the so-called Ethiopian human rights and civic organization. I didn't see it. That's unacceptable. Okay. And what is a Muslim? Igar Machwal, Jawar Sirajinna, Dr. Said, 
ለማጣፈጫ ጠቦ ተደረጉ እንጂ እዚህ ኮንፈረንስ look at the name where is the muslim in a country where almost half of the population are muslim it is shame for all of you and for all of us for not having muslims therefore multifaceted problems require collective participation collective participation does not come by wishing and pretending it comes by hard work therefore ethiopia belongs to all of us and all of its people we must make a genuine uh, genuine effort to involve each and every stakeholder despite their political and other differences so namin and others stop excuses if you want to work for ethiopia stop excuses a step up outreach thank you